You, of course, are James Williamson from the legendary The Stooges, and you were actually like the original member of The Stooges, weren't you? No, no, no. You're mixing me up with Ron Ashton. No, I I came in, uh, they did two albums before I joined the band, and by then we, we were calling ourselves... Iggy and the Stooges, and I did the third album, Raw Power, right. and then uh, subsequently I also did uh, Kill City with him, and I did New Values, and then finally I did Ready to Die last year, and then of course I'm working on this project by myself now. All right, okay. Actually, was it Ron Ashton's brother who died just recently? Yes, yes. Ronnie himself died in 2009. And that's how I ended up coming back into the band. And then Ronnie's brother, Scott, just died on actually March 15th, I think it was. So, yeah, very recently. So both of the brothers are are gone. How was reuniting with the band? Did it bring up old memories and old songs again? Oh, sure. You know, I mean, we we go back into our 20s. And so, in a way, uh, that was partially why I came back was because they, after Ronnie died, you know, they kind of needed me to do it. And it turned out to be a lot of fun. So, you know, we've been touring the last four and a half, five years and uh, really having a good time. We've, you know, we've done Australia a couple of times over that period and always had a good time down there really enjoyed the people down there and and, uh, the shows have been good. So, yeah, really no complaints. And you are just releasing an album which is reworked songs that you and Iggy wrote back in 1973-74. That's right, yes. There was a period of time there right after we finished uh, Raw Power and we were we were touring and had changed management that we thought that CBS Records, which had our record contract, was going to pick up the option for us to make a second record after Raw Power. And so we wrote a lot of material and uh, we we were touring behind that material. And so a lot of it, well, almost, well, all of it really was recorded live from various different sources. And we never did you know, they never did pick up their option, and so we never did make that second album, and we all there's been all these years is all these bootlegs. And so I've always kind of wanted to go into the studio and redo those songs properly in the studio because I think the songwriting is really, really strong. But, uh, you know, of course, the songs sound the same on the bootlegs, but the live performances and the poor recordings and stuff make them rather painful to listen to sometimes. <laughs> so, yeah, so anyway, I got around to, we, we took this year off of touring, and I figured, you know what, I'm going to do it. And so, um, yeah, that's one more kick off my bucket list. So what was it like finding the female vocalist to front it? Of course, the first singles off of it have got Caroline Wonderland singing them. Caroline Wonderland. Yeah, well, first of all, how do you like that? They're good, yeah. I've, I've heard two of them now. Yeah, yeah. She's a great singer. Yeah. I, I, You know what? We, we played that song live for maybe the last two or three years. And so, you know, I played a lot. And I sort of came up with a little different arrangement towards the end there last year and I've always felt like uh, that that song would benefit from a very strong female vocalist that could kind of belt out a song, you know, the way a Janis Joplin used to do kind of a thing. And I I had the hardest time finding one that was that good. And eventually a friend of mine from Austin, Texas sent me a link of Carolyn Wonderland playing. I'd never heard of her before and singing and you know as soon as i heard her i just said that's my girl right there so i i uh, i tracked her down you know i have uh, mutual acquaintances who have worked with her and stuff and so anyway she got about you know one day she, she was down the road and she got about 10 emails from different people going you know hey this guy's trying to get a hold of you you know blah 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 and uh, so she got back to me and she was totally cool she was like okay let's do it so, uh, yeah, I, you know, I went down to Austin and with the track and I went in the studio with her and it was like four takes. She was done. You know, she was, she was that good. And, uh, yeah, it was a pleasure working with her. And I've, I've done some live shows with her at South by Southwest this year as well. She's, she's a real sweetheart. 
I bet you no one would say no to you asking them to sing on one of your songs. Well, you know what? So far, you're right. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm doing pretty well on this album, which is really a little bit surprising to me because, you know, I don't know all these people. And, and so, you know, I just say, and, hey, you know, so-and-so said, that, you know, you're the right person to do this for this. And I've listened to you and I agree. And, you know, would you, would you sing on this? And they go, yeah, you know. Cool. <laughs> so it's, been, it's been really, you know, it's been great. I actually look forward to hearing the one that Lisa Kakula from The Bell raised. Oh, she's unbelievable. Yeah. I mean, i that's the next one. You know, that's the next single is her singing I Gotta Write and Heavy Liquid, and she is just amazing. I, You know, a friend of mine, again, suggested her, and I heard her voice, and I said, God, bring her in. <laughs> and so she drove in. Uh, I was down in L.A., and she, she's out in Riverside near, you know, quite a, you know, like an hour's drive out. And she just came in morning and just nailed that song. And just in a way that she just go. Wow! So, oh, yeah. so I'm I'm really excited about that too. That's the second single. Cool. Did, how does it feel getting back in the studio again and recording? I mean, things have certainly changed since the '70s. Oh yeah. Well, you know, of course, I had just finished an album uh, called Ready to Die uh, last year, so I, I had been in the studio fairly recently. But you know, going back. Before that, when I went back in, yes, everything has changed dramatically. <laughs> and, you know, on the other hand, some things don't change. So um, a lot of the things that I liked about the studio back in those days are still true. Like, for example, you know, tape sounds better than anything else yes. in terms of the, what it does to the sound. You know, there's a certain kind of compression that the tape gives it that you just can't get digitally. And uh, and the analog, you know, kind of equipment that came from my era is also really the best sounding stuff. I mean, there's lots of stuff that you can use. It's digital now. That's pretty close, but isn't convincing like the real thing. And so what we did was used a combination of, of that kind of stuff. So we used analog stuff to record with, but then went straight to digital. And so the real advantage of digital is the editing. Editing is like night and day different from it was back then when you used to use a razor blade and cut the tape <laughs> and splice yes. it together. You know, <laughs> really in the dark ages, <laughs> right? But now now you can, of course, edit quite easily. Well, I'm looking at your Wikipedia page. When you picked up the guitar in seventh grade, did you ever imagine that your life was going to end up being, I'm, I'm sure that being with Iggy Pop and the Stooges has been one hell of a ride. Yeah, no, no. How could I know? You know, how could I know? <laughs> you know, I, I had very, my only aspiration was that some good-looking girl would be interested in me because I played the guitar. <laughs> you know, I just, I didn't really think, you know, there was much beyond that. And anyway, no, I, had, I could not possibly know that. And I, uh, of course, it was quite a long time until I actually even ran into Higgy for the first time, not for several years yet. And, you know, I had no idea that actually people would think I was, you know, a good guitar player. I mean, I just thought I was, you know, kind of doing what I did, and I kind of mostly did it in my room, you know. So it's uh, it's funny how that works out. You know, you just do things, the, you know, the way you feel the passion for them, and, you know, a lot of times it works out for you. Yeah, and when you joined, it says here too that the band were struggling with you know, getting recognition and also drug problems and that. And then David Bowie offered you the chance to go to London and record. Yeah, we had a lot of problems at that time, and we, we kind of had a lot really broken up. And Iggy and I were going to go to London to start a new band, really. Yeah, David Bowie's management actually was who got us that record contract. But, you know, David was a big fan and so he helped us get over to London, and other than that, really, uh, we did the album all on our own and just have brought him in to, to mix the album at the end because we made such a mess of it. But, you know, it was weird. We were a bunch of, uh, you know, kind of bumpkins, you know, from Detroit who had never been out of the country before, 
And here we go, we get parachuted into the ground zero of glam, you know, with David Bowie and, and Mark Boland and, you know, all these guys. And, like, here here we are, like, wow, you know, what is this? And so, you know, you you see us, if you look on the back of Raw Power, you see us, like, you see me in white face and everything, and you see Iggy with, like, black lipstick on and stuff. And that was because, like, we, you know, all these guys are, are using makeup, and we're going, well... I guess we should wear some makeup, you know? <laughs> and, of course, we didn't know what to do with it. And so we went out and kind of got a clown box of stuff, like, you know, crayons to paint ourselves with, but we didn't know what to do with it. So, yeah, you know, it was kind of, it was, it was kind of funny, but very true. Is that where the name Raw Power came from? Was it really raw and, you know, unclean and grungy? No, I know, I, although you could conjure that up. <laughs> uh, no, it, I think it, it typically, you know, there's a song on the album called Raw Power, and we typically named albums back in those days after one of the, you know, stronger cuts on the album. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, like, Iggy Pop and the Stooges, and, like, it's just legendary and with all the drug problems. And, I mean, in Australia, there's that classic film clip on countdown of Iggy on stage waving his microphone around to the audience and them all sort of backing off to get out of the way. <laughs> Do you remember that? Did you see yeah, that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. He was the first guy that ever was confrontational to the audience. <laughs> and people really were not used to their entertainers confronting them. You know, they didn't know what to do. And so uh, I, almost all the audiences were that way. Yeah, it's a classic piece of Australian television, but you must have so many stories. I mean, someone could probably easy do a five-hour interview with you and still have stories to tell, but can you tell us something, tell us one story that stands out in your mind that's really memorable? Oh dear, there there are so many, but I, you know, I of course we have very little time left, so I'll just spit a real quick one in. Uh, my wife, who I've been married to for thirty three years now, was introduced to me by the, our roadie, and so she comes backstage at the Whiskey at Gogo, and the backstage is upstairs in the second story, and it has a ramp going down to the stage. And and so that's how the performers get on stage, and this ramp is kind of covered, and then you hit the stage from that. So here we are, and, and uh, you know, I won't bore you with all the details, but basically it's time to go on stage, and, you know, Iggy's got to go to the bathroom. And so <laughs> he, uh, we don't have any more time, so he just lets it rip all the way down the ramp, you know, and going on stage, and my wife is looking at this, and she wouldn't go out with me for like seven years <laughs> until, until after that, until uh, until that kind of wore off. Oh, I I wish I'd seen that. But anyway, your album Re Leaked is going to be available on April nineteenth, and people can go to straightjameswilliamson dot com to get more details about that. It's the single that's coming out on Record Store Day. The album probably won't come out until September. But, yeah, stay tuned to that website. Right. And, uh, yeah, I mean, check it out. I think you'll like it. Yeah, we definitely yeah. will. Thank you very much. I'm sorry for letting the time get away, but you're just fascinating. I could have talked to you. No about. worries, Kat. <laughs> it's nice talking to you. And good luck, and people should definitely keep an eye out for that single, which is Open Up and Bleed and Give Me Some Skin on April 19th. Awesome. And Thank you. See you later. Bye. Bye-bye.